Hey again, everybody. We're going to just do a kind of brief overview here of the different insulin regimens. This is not commonly tested on your exam simply because so much of this is um, kind of in the air. It's a clinical judgment call. And then there's also a lot of dosing stuff in here. I try to keep this really, really, really basic. Um, I did my previous talk on insulin regimens. I kind of went a little bit more in depth. Um, I want to try to keep this just germane to the exam. Um, so I'm giving you a kind of a broad overview. Um, some of this will help you when you see diabetic patients in the clinic uh, or in the hospital and kind of help you understand what exactly your attendings are doing. Um, so this is, again, it's not going to be, this is not going to be sufficient information for you if you're a senior resident, uh, but it's pretty good if you're a junior or certainly a medical student or a mid-level student, okay? If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel, and you will get uh, updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. Okay, so when do we start insulin in diabetes? Uh, well, you should know that we start insulin in all type 1 diabetics. Um, these are people whose pancreas is just fried from an immune response. Um, so these patients don't make insulin, and so they always need insulin. This used to be called insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Um, it's not called that anymore for reasons we'll go into. Um, so this is the primary treatment for all type 1 diabetics. We will never put a type 1 diabetic on metformin or thiazolidine dienes or SGLT2 inhibitors or anything like that. All type 2 diabetics will get insulin if they have an A1C of over 9.0, 9.0 or higher, uh, and they have diabetic-related complications or if they have failed maximal antihyperglycemic therapy. If they're just not able, we're not able to get them under control uh, with medications, um, then we will uh, go for insulin. There are a myriad of insulin formulations, and it all started with just regular human insulin, and then they were modified. It was modified so that some insulins we could get to work really quickly and some insulins we could get to uh, kind of stick with you all day. And uh, so more and more have come out. And so now, unfortunately, you have to remember the various types of insulin. So there is the rapid acting insulins, which are Lispro, Aspart, and Glulacine. These are used as a bolus, uh, which we'll come to in a little bit. Uh, there's also short acting. This is also commonly used as a bolus, and that's just regular insulin. So these you can consider your bolus insulins because they work really fast. Then there's the intermediate acting insulins. That's NPH, as well as a protamine insulin. So what does protamine mean? Basically, it's chemically modified rapid-acting insulin. So we're taking something like Lispro or Aspart, and we're chemically modifying it, and so it's now called Lispro protamine or Aspart protamine. And basically what that just means is that it, is, uh, it, it acts over a longer period of time. Um, so you've taken a rapid-acting, chemically modified it, and now it's intermediate-acting. Um, so what that word protamine should tell you is that we've just taken that insulin and modified it so it lasts longer. It uh, absorbs more slowly, if you will. And then there's the long-acting insulins, and these are Detamir, Glargine, and Degludec. And what you'll find with these is that they last all day, 24 hours. So these you could consider to be prandial. I'm sorry, uh, you consider these to be basal. Bolus and prandial are the same thing. I wanted to mention that. Okay, so bolus, prandial, same thing. Basal, remember, it's a basal insulin level. Okay? It's our, our insulin that we could give um, to last a long period of time. And then there's combinations. We'll come to that in a little bit. So this is just um, comparing the different formulations. You can see with these rapid-acting insulins, which are usually given as boluses, they work very quickly, but they don't last long. Um, then with these sort of long-acting insulins, they, they do work fairly quickly. I mean, one to four hours. But the point here is that they're gentle, but they last a long time. So it kind of gives you that basal insulin secretion or mimics that basal insulin secretion. Now let's apply this. Um, this is just a, a, a chart here. 
So this is normally what happens uh, throughout the day as you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're not counting snacks here. Uh, your insulin secretion goes up after each meal. Uh, but you always have this sort of basal level. You never have zero insulin in your blood. Um, so what that means then is that it's able to regulate the glucose level throughout the day, whether that be while you're fasting or after you eat. And so ideally with insulin regimens, we want to try to mimic this as much as possible. So um, with basal insulin regimens, this is typically reserved for type 2 diabetes. So these are people who we give them insulin as kind of a kick in the butt, but uh, these are people who are able to make their own insulin um, to some degree after they eat. So they have an insulin uh, deficiency perhaps, uh, but uh, we're able to just give them that basal level of insulin. And then we generally can rely on these patients to make a little bit of endogenous insulin after they eat. Um, so the point here is that we wanna keep this really simple. We give them one injection, uh, in the morning or in the evening with a long-acting insulin, or you can do twice daily with a combination therapy. But the point here is that we're not giving medications before the person eats. That is a prandial or a bolus insulin. So we're just giving an insulin to last the whole day, uh, and, and, and we're not giving insulin before meals. Now, you can also, with type 2 diabetics, you can also provide metformin or continue metformin or one of those GLP-1 receptor agonists um, along with the insulin. So some people think, well, if we if we start insulin, we have to get rid of all the oral antihyperglycemic drugs. And you don't have to do that. Um, you can continue antihyperglycemics along with insulin. As a matter of fact, metformin plus insulin has been shown to be very effective. Um, now, the basal prandial or basal bolus is for type 1 diabetics, it's for pregnant patients who need insulin, and it's for type 2 diabetics who fail to control with basal insulin alone. And so what we have here is a long-acting insulin that's given in the morning and a more rapid-acting insulin uh, before each meal, one or more meals. And then there's the sliding scale. You've probably seen this in the hospital. This is only done in the hospital. We'll come back to that. So the once daily, we just give uh, a long-acting insulin in the morning or in the evening. Um, there are a number that you can use. Detamir or Glargine can be given either in the morning or in the evening. If you go for NPH, um, that you have to give in the evening. Um, so NPH is commonly given because it's cheaper. Uh, normal insulin and uh, or regular insulin and NPH are, are both cheaper. You can get them for like $25 at Walmart. Um, so this is what we go for first, ideally, in type 2 diabetics who need insulin. Now, the twice-daily insulin regimen, what we do here is we give a pre-mixed combination. So often you'll see 70-30. There's also 75-25 and 50-50, but we usually go with 70-30. And what we have here is both NPH and regular. So what we're doing here is we're giving this twice a day, not necessarily before meals, although it often uh, we often do give it before meals. We don't have to, but we often do because it's just easier to remember. So you, uh, you take it in the morning before breakfast and at night before dinner. Um, so that is the twice daily. Um, this is good for people with fixed meal schedules because um, if they... If you're taking twice daily and you skip lunch, then you can become hypoglycemic. So you have to, this is best for people who have fixed meal schedules. And when we talk about basal bolus, uh, you'll see why that's superior for people who don't have fixed meal schedules. This is just another chart here. You can see how this is beginning to look like our general physiologic uh, secretion of insulin. Now, the basal prandial or basal bolus insulin regimen is the closest to mimicking the physiologic pattern. This is what we do for type 1 diabetics and for pregnant diabetics, as well as type 2 diabetics who have failed to get under control with the other insulin therapies we've talked about. Um, this is given in multiple doses, and so this is why it is a problem uh, is because you have to have multiple kinds of insulin. So you have to have a special insulin for your basal and a special insulin for your prandial, your bolus. Um, so the nice thing about this, if you can do it, it's a pain in the butt, but if you can do it, 
then you're getting your bolus of insulin for your meals with your meals. So if you decide to have lunch at three o'clock instead of at noon, then you can do it. You just take your insulin at a different time. Now there's something called basal plus, and it's kind of in between basal and basal prandial. Um, so what that means is that you can have a, let's say a once daily dosage of insulin, and maybe with one meal you take a bolus, but the other two you don't. Um, and then, uh, but with basal prandial, you're taking a bolus before each meal. So there's basal plus, which you'll take a bolus with one meal, maybe with two meals. And then there's, if, you, if you're taking it before every meal, the, the short acting insulin, then it's called basal prandial. The daily dosage is going to be a long acting, generally taken in the morning. Detamir or glargine, NPH, you would take that in the evening. So you only take it once a day. You only take the long acting insulin once a day. You don't take it more than once. Um, when we talk about taking a longer acting insulin more than once a day, that was back here with the twice daily basal insulin regimen. Um, in that case, we're doing a, a, a pre-mixed combination, but you're never gonna take glargine uh, or detamir more than once. You only take it once. Remember, it, it works for 24 hours. And then for the bolus, for your prandial insulin, uh, you'll take a short-acting insulin like Lispro, Aspart, or Glulacine, and that works very quickly. Now then there's this sliding scale. Um, this is used in the hospital. Now why this is used only in the hospital is that it requires very, very, very close monitoring of the blood glucose level. It also requires someone who can really make sure that it's being done right. So a nurse, doctor, whatever. Um, so what we do here is we just measure the blood glucose every four hours, every six hours, whatever you need, and then we provide insulin based on that. Now, why is this used in the hospital? Because people who have inflammatory processes or infections, or maybe they're going in for surgery, um, they can do funky things with their with their insulin levels, um, and their their blood glucose level can can change dramatically depending on their uh, on, on their health. Um, so for optimal control, we just respond to the numbers. Um, now, it's very difficult. Ideally, if we could with everybody, we would do this, but it's just not practical on an outpatient basis. So this is done inpatient. Now, this is similar, I guess, in theory to how those pumps work, uh, th those insulin pumps, because they're constantly checking your blood glucose level and then uh, giving the insulin uh, at, at a level that's consistent with your blood glucose level. This is not necessary to know for the USMLE, but it is good to know that this is something you'll use and you will run into in the inpatient wards when you have a patient who is on insulin. Some pearls, uh, this is kind of a recap too, so in type 2 diabetic patients start with the once daily regimen, continue the metformin or in cretins like the GLP-1 receptor agonists. You can also do those DPP-4 inhibitors or the SGLT-2 inhibitors. Those are fine as well. With type 1 diabetic and pregnant patients, we do the basal prandial regimen. Insulin is the preferred treatment of diabetes in pregnancy because it does not cross the placenta. Metformin is probably safe, uh, but insulin is still preferred. There is continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions, which are pumps. They're commonly used in type 1 diabetes. You don't need to know those. The exact dosage of insulin is variable and depends on glycemic control, so you will not need to know doses for your exam. The insulin regimen may and often is adjusted in certain situations. So if the patient takes up an exercise regimen, you can bet your bottom dollar that they're going to need to change their insulin regimen. And so for this reason, they generally have a specialist that they can go to regarding their insulin dosing. Fasting, vomiting, diarrhea, pre-op, for obvious reasons, will reduce your insulin demand. More insulin would be needed in times of illness or in stress. Uh, that's why we use the sliding scale, particularly in the inpatient setting. If they're on glucocorticoids, that's going to ramp up your pr production of, of sugar in your body, gluconeogenesis, so you're going to need more insulin. And then pregnancy. If you're taking step one, human placental lactogen increases insulin resistance. So pregnant women will likely need to go up on their insulin as the pregnancy progresses. Patients should avoid injecting insulin in the same location every time. You can get lipohypertrophy, and if you have lipohypertrophy and you're injecting it into fat, 
um, then you may not absorb properly. And so it's recommended that you inject in different places every time. That's not difficult. The major adverse effect with insulin is, oh my gosh, calciparis, hypoglycemia. Uh, so um, this is a big problem. This is why it's very difficult to dose this. And you know, depending on your activities or your meals, it, you may run into this um, more often uh, than you'd want to. There's something called the Dawn phenomenon. That gets asked occasionally on your exam. So what this is, is patients who wake up with high blood sugar and what happened was that overnight while they were sleeping, they secreted growth hormone. That's normal. Uh, you secrete growth hormone at night. Well, growth hormone happens to increase your blood sugar. Um, so they'll wake up then with a high morning fasting, essentially, uh, blood glucose. So it's not a huge deal, but we ideally would not like this to happen. So what we would then do is we would just move up that PM dose of insulin um, closer to bedtime. 